<laughs> What's good, people? Back again. These podcasts are coming thick and th- fast. Um, and we've got the man himself. Leon, how are we, pal? Yeah, not too bad, Joseph. You? Yeah, mate, not too bad. We were just discussing, obviously, lockdown hair and, and, and stuff, which is, you know, I think you're quite lucky. You've, you've kind of had the same haircut most of your career, so you're all right, I think, with the rest <laughs> yeah. of us. <laughs> Yeah, I can get yeah, I can get away with a home haircut, but I think you uh, you might have some trouble. You might get a bit of stick afterwards. What was that like at Luton? Obviously, you made your first team debut at sixteen. Um, yeah. What What's that like? Obviously, I remember me at sixteen. Christ, I I was basically I was still chasing girls at sixteen, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? Obviously, at sixteen, and did you like how long before the game did you know that you were going to be playing? Um, I think at the time it was, it might have been Mark Neal who was in charge and I didn't really, um, he wasn't one to let people know who's starting the game. So I didn't really know. So I just prepared the same way I would for any other game if I knew I was starting or not. So mm-hmm. it was just, I was more excited of being in the, the squad and traveling with the first team. Um, and I think it was sort of the 86th minute when Marvin Johnson was playing. Um, and he just says, Leon, are you, are you ready to come on? I was like, am I ready? I'm more than ready, but you know, I'm a little bit nervous. But um, yeah, I managed to get on I think it was only for a couple of minutes, but um, like you said, to make your debut at 16 at any sort of club, especially, is, um, is, a, is a big achievement. And was that, obviously, you're from Luton, correct? Uh, yeah, so yeah, brought up in, and, um, yeah, brought up in Luton, but I was obviously born in Stevenage. But yeah, most of my lifetime I've, I've spent in Luton. And was it like, were you on the bench before that moment? Or was this your, like, your first experience with the, like, on the bench and stuff? Or? Um, so I think back then it was called the LDVs um, um, competition. So it was sort of like a the Worthington Cup or the Carabao Cup. That's the mm-hmm. sort of thing it was, it was at. But I remember I was training with the sort of the reserves and, and, and um, playing the majority of the games for them instead of like the youth team. Um, and the first team coach was obviously watching those games that I played and um, he included me in the squad. So like I said, it was a bit of a surprise, but I was never going to say no to, to, to travel with the first team. It was... Obviously, a little bit daunting, but um, I think if you want to be a professional, you've got to sort of step up to the challenges and take it with both hands. And like I said, I was, I was, I don't think I was ready at the time, but I was obviously ready to to take on the next step. Were you always that player? Obviously, you're a stature of a man, like you're a, you're a big guy. Were you obviously like that at 16? And did you kind of have the the kind of personality personality to kind of hold that? Um, I don't. I think I was quite tall for my uh, my age. Anyway, I was I wouldn't say I was the tallest, but I was mm. quite tall and quite a slim sort of frame. And you know, there's nothing of me. And I think it got to a stage where people were starting to say to me, "Oh yeah, why you stay?" They used to ask me, oh, "What position do you play?" And I, you know, at the time they moved me from right wing and they put me as a defender. And I used to say, "Yeah, I'm centre half." There, and then people would kind of like have a little snigger and they have a little laugh and think he's a little bit too small for a centre half. <laughs> and I don't know. I think over the, over the years, I've not put on weight quite like on purpose I think it's just obviously with age it sort of not catches up with you but you you sort of grow into a man and mm. I think that's what's, what's happened to me and I've sort of grown into the sort of position that I've, I've made my career in. And your time at Luton obviously you then got a big move was it to West Brom? Yeah. And how, like how, does, how does that come about and how do you obviously how old were you at the time? Uh, I think I was 20, 21 around that sort of age. Were you kind of, was that kind of a big, a big step for you in your career? Like, obviously, being 21, playing, but you were like, right, we're going to make a big move now here. How was that to yeah. deal with? Uh, it, it sounds so snobbish and so mean, but at the time, obviously, you, say that you hear the old fellas say this quite often, that, you know, the fee that I went for, like, 3.5 million is a lot of money back then. Yeah. And it was a lot of money back then, and... I don't know. I I didn't feel like there was any pressure on me, and I don't want to sound big headed or anything. But mm. I didn't I didn't look at the fee and think, oh wow, I'm going for this amount of money. I just, mm. you know, I didn't really want to. My head wasn't concentrating on the money. It was more sort of I can't wait for, you know, the opportunity to go play for West Brom. Obviously, at the time they'd just been relegated from the from the mm. Premier League and they were in the Championship and they were one of the favourites. So I looked at it as more of a challenge and something that sort of stuck out with me is some of the players that they had and you know the stadium that you know their home stadium and I don't know it, it had a lot of history behind the club and I just like I said it was more of a challenge to me than it was sort of 
the, the tag that was on my head. And mm. I remember obviously uh, before that, before I moved, um, Kevin Blackwell was the manager at the time, and he spoke to me um, at the start of the season and just said, "Oh, listen, we've you know we've had an offer." And I said, "Oh, well, you know, what does that mean?" And he says, uh, "We've had an offer from a club, and you know we want you to to, to progress your career." And I actually thought at the time that they were just trying to shift me out of the club or you yeah. know get me out the back door, and you know they didn't really want me, and I'm sort of questioned it and uh, obviously went and spoke to my agent at the time and he said, you know, you know what, Leon, it's a, it's a good step for you to take. These these um, these offers don't really come around off, often and, you know, it's a good challenge for you to have to progress on your career and he recommended that I should take it and, you know, I actually, it sounds silly, but I didn't really want to go. Like, I, yeah. I didn't really, I used to think West Brom was sort of an hour and a half, maybe two hours at push and, you know, I was, I was, like I said, I was brought up in Lewin and that's where all my friends and family were. And mm. I felt like I was m- moving a million miles away and I didn't really want to go. But the only reason I wanted to go is because of the challenge that, that was ahead. And I will touch on, obviously, Kevin Blackwell because I've always I've heard a lot about him in, in terms of him as a manager, him as a guy. What's, it, what's he like to, to work under? And do you think it would uh, be different, your kind of maybe perception of him, if you were working under him at an older age in your career? Yeah, well, maybe. I, when he when he comes to the club, I think I was probably about 19, 20. Um, so I remember him coming into the club and he'd obviously been with other previous clubs like Sheffield United and, you know, had a bit of a reputation um, for being very successful and, um, I don't know how to put it, maybe just, you know, really hard on, like, the players and, and obviously what is a win. And I don't know, I just used to think, oh, you know, I don't know whether... Uh, He's going to be my sort of kettle of fish. And I, mm. obviously, like when a new manager comes in, it's down to the whole boys to sort of step up to the game. And it's just like in a normal job, you know, if a new manager comes in, you've got to sort of work hard because you never know, you might be out the, of out the door. But mm. um, yeah, I, I was excited to see him come, um, but I was a little bit nervous to see if, you know, if I'll be still in and around the first team. And mm-hmm. fortunately enough, um, I managed to stay in, the f- in and around the first team. And I think the next season I ended up, sort of cementing my, my place in, in centre-half and kind of progress from there. And it would be interesting to see what, you know, if I went to a club that he's at now and being an older player to see if he's the same sort of manager that he is now. But, mm. um, yeah, I, I've never had no sort of arguments or qualms or any disagreements with him. So I can't really sort of give him any negative feedback. Yeah, no, it makes sense though. But you obviously went to West Brom in the end and you have a little stint away at Coventry on loan, was it? Yes, yes, I did. So obviously, Roberto Di Matteo was in charge, and I remember him coming in. And you know, even like when you look back now, he, he is an absolute legend. He obviously won the Champions League, but before that, he had and he had, you know, won the FA Cup with, mm. with Chelsea as a player. And I don't know, to, to have him as a manager, I was just kind of like, I was more sort of going into his office and asking for his autograph. That was sort of my <laughs> like, I just looked up to him so much. And, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I like I said, when a new manager comes in, um, everybody wants to impress and. Um, I, if I'm honest, I, I wasn't sort of in his playing life, like the way he played, I wasn't mm-hmm. sort of fitting in. So, um, like I said, I, I've always, wherever I've been, I've always wanted to play. You know, there's no sort of, I want to go there because of the money. I wanted mm-hmm. to play at West Brom, at a club that was, you know, in the championship and wanted to stay up in the Premier League. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, he came in and, and sort of changed the sort of uh, philosophy that, that West Brom sort of um, hired me in, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't really see in his plans. And, I spoke to my agent and we thought it was a good time to sort of look elsewhere and I spent a, you know, a, not a big chunk, but a, a big chunk of this season on loan at, at, at Coventry. You said there about kind of not being in the manager's plans and kind of looking up to him because obviously like you've watched him on TV growing up and stuff. Do you think in looking at the managers now, like you've got like Lampard, Arteta, Gerard, all these managers up there, obviously they've kind of grew up watching watching them and then obviously what happened at Chelsea with Lampard obviously supposedly the players weren't playing for him all this kind of stuff do you think it helps or well, the difference is that obviously we're brought up watching the Premier League and these are you know English players we're there to watch them do you think that's the difference in like Mason Mount will play for Lampard because it's Frank Lampard Timo Werner comes in and goes okay you're, you're, I don't care about, I don't really give a crap about what you've done. I don't care about you as a manager. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there is obviously players that sort of think of it like the Mason Mount example that you gave mm. and uh, to Werner's. But um, I don't know, if you're, 
obviously I don't want to offend anybody, but I think if you're an English player or someone that knows sort of Frank Lampard's um, playing career, mm. I don't know anybody that would sort of not want to play for him. Like yeah. I said, the man's won some serious, serious uh, titles at, at different levels. And mm. I don't know, like I said, like when you, when you look at the players, I don't know, that played for England and now are managers, it's, it's phenomenal. Like yeah. if I was still playing, I was at a club like, I don't know, Derby County and you've got, you know, you've got Wayne Rooney as a, as a manager, that's phenomenal. Like, uh, I wasn't a Man United supporter, but to see him, to see what he's done over his career and yeah. he's obviously coming to be a manager. I don't know, personally, if he was my manager, he'd, he'd definitely up my game. You see, Steven Gerrard being the manager of Rangers and Lampard at Chelsea, I think it's, you know, it's only going to be beneficial for the players. But like you said, if, if, if you're someone that doesn't really know Steven Gerrard and, you know, you've come abroad or you, you don't really support the team and you, you're not really a fan of favourite of him, then I don't know, I suppose it does change your sort of mentality. But for me personally, I can only speak on my behalf. Um, I think it would sort of get me going every single day. That would be yeah. someone that I'd want to work with every single day. No, 100%, mate. And your time, obviously, we spoke then about Coventry. And after Coventry, you obviously got your permanent move. Was it to Norwich then? It was, yeah. How... Because I have to ask, and uh, the other half's mum, mum's family is all from Norwich, and I have to say this: I always looked at Norwich and think that is a weird place, and it's it's, a, it's like it's nowhere near anything. It's like the other side; it's like yeah. south, you could say, but it's two hours away from everything. I look back at that Norwich True. team when I was when I was looking back at today, and when obviously you went in when they just got promoted, was is that right? Yeah, at the start of the season, yeah. yeah. I look back now, and I didn't realise this at the time. How did that team stay up two years in a row in eleven? Like how how good how good was is that down to? I said about I said it earlier. I looked at that team when I saw it on paper. I was like, "You're proper football players." Do you know what I mean when I say yeah. that? Like, you're proper players. There's there's no kind of big prima donnas like your Grant Holt, your Wesley Hulihans, yourself, um, John Ruddy, obviously in goal. What, what was that like at that time? Obviously, you're making a step up again in your obviously quite young career at the time. Um, well, I'll go back to the point of when you said, obviously, where Norwich is. Like, like you said, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. And I remember speaking to my agent and I was like, I do not want to go to Norwich. Like you said, like the nearest place is sort of like two hours away. There's no sort of, I know Ipswich is, the, is, the, is, a, is a rivalry, but obviously when Norwich goes to the Premier League and Ipswich aren't in the Premier League, you know, Tottenham, I think it's Tottenham's the, the nearest rival and that's like an hour 45. So it's just... Um, yeah, it's a bit unheard of, and that was another place I didn't really want to go. Like I said, it was just, yeah, it's just, it's more of a slow type of living. But yeah. when I got there, honestly, I, I, I now live in a village because obviously when I was in Norwich, I had to live in a village, and it was, mm. I don't know, I, I loved it so much. Like the, the people there were unbelievable. The, I don't know, the fans were there were, I know you hear it all the time, but the fans there were phenomenal. Um, even the players, like like you said earlier, like there was no sort of premium orders. Nobody thought they were sort of had like a big time attitude mm-hmm. um, and I quite like that personally just everybody everybody didn't sort of think they were bigger than anybody and I think when I walked into the change room it sounds really really harsh but I didn't I didn't know everybody's name and that was quite yeah. I don't know it was quite embarrassing just not knowing their name and just shouting yeah for the ball when I don't know they probably didn't know my name and I remember um, obviously after a couple of years I spoke to, to Wes Houlihan and he actually didn't know who I was and that, he actually said to me, he thought I was a youth team player that had come up from, from Norwich and obviously started playing in the first team, which was great. I think that was phenomenal. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think when you look back at the team, for them to get promoted, and I think it was great because everybody sort of underestimated that team. I think a lot of people thought, oh, yeah, you know what, they're, they're just, you know, their idea is just to stay up and, you know, there's no big time players. And I think it was great. I think it worked in our favour. I think a lot of people underestimated us and didn't really know our game plan. And I think, Everybody worked for the manager. Everybody got on, and I don't know. It was, it, it was a great atmosphere in the change room, and I think, um, yeah, to get for them to get back to back promotions, it's not it's not done often. I think Leicester and, and Southampton have done it, but you know, the way that they did it, it's just phenomenal. And I think, I know he's obviously at Ipswich now, but I think obviously the manager Paul Lambert at the time had a massive, uh, massive, yeah, had a massive influence in the team progression. That was on to my next point, like. How was Paul Lambert? Obviously, what a player, but in terms of his management style, what was that like? Obviously, and what was it 
down to him that you wanted to move to Norwich or, or how did that all come about in terms of wanting to uh, yeah I remember, I remember speaking to him on the phone and it, I, not not often but I uh, whenever I moved in my career I actually spoke to a manager and they actually sort of told me I'm I don't know some managers don't like to speak to their player until they see yeah. him like face to face but I remember speaking to him on the phone and he was saying listen Leon you know I understand that you're not playing but I want you to sort of do well the shackles are off when you come here you're on, you're on low and I want you to you know help us progress on and and um Obviously, we got talking and he said to me, he's, even on the phone, he just says, you know, we're not here just to, in the championship to make up the numbers. We're not here just to stay up. I want to progress and I want to get promoted. So I was like thinking to myself, you know, what? I was actually thinking, oh, you know, what? Norwich, they've just come up. It, it probably is a safe idea just to, you know, steady the ship and, and stay yeah. up. But he had obviously better ideas and he saw, he had a vision that every, everybody else jumped on board. And I thought, especially in the first training session, um, he was very intense. Um, I know it's a big comparison, but I, I sort of c- kind of compare him to Diego Simeone. You'd sort of be barking and shouting at the touchline, and you know all his players would always want to work hard for him, and they'd always yeah. go that extra mile to, I don't know, put a tackle in or make that extra block on the line, or you know, try and beat a player. So yeah, I just I, I think he was a massive influence, especially in my career, and I think for the, for the whole team in general. How were the players around there like those characters that we? Saw, especially at that time of Norwich, and I think you can kind of look at the Norwich team now and think you look at the characters in terms of what we're visually seeing, like from the spine down, kind of John Ruddy, Houlihan, um, obviously Grant Holt up front. What was it like to be around those characters every day? I think we already know what know. Holt's like. <laughs> yeah, and no, I honestly, it was great. Like, I um, I come there and I was. I must have been about 23, 24, and mm. so I was still learning the game, still understanding, you know, what people do and their obviously egos and stuff like that. And I, I don't know, I, I seem to get on with everybody really well. There wasn't anyone that sort of, um, I don't know, got on my nerves or annoyed me or, or someone I didn't really like. But to be fair, I remember when I was, <laughs> when I come into the change room and I, I was sat next to uh, Simon Lappin, obviously I was number 20 and mm-hmm. Simon Lappin was number 19, so we sit next to your number, whoever's you know, similar sort of number to you. And I remember having a really nice conversation with Simon Lappin, you know, he was asking me about my family and, you know, you know, where have I moved to? Am I in the hotel? Um, and really like kind of like making me settle in. Um, and then we obviously, you know, got to about half time, half 10. So we just made our way around the pitch. And I remember doing sort of like a keep ball. And, you know, I, my training session weren't the greatest of, of training sessions. And I remember sort of Simon Lappin absolutely going crazy at me, you know, really shouting at me and you know, really on me I've lost the ball so many times and I thought who is, like, who is this like why is he talking to me like this we was having a civilised chat sort of like 10 minutes ago and now he's really getting into me and I remember straight afterwards we was obviously cleaning our boots and he come in um, and I kind of walked away because I didn't really want to talk to him I know he's obviously been battering me on the pitch and sat down in the change room and it's I don't know he just the way that he spoke to me in the change room was back to normal it was like what is going on I thought he was bipolar but he was just honestly that's just the sort of person he is he yeah, he's very sort of intense on the on the uh, on the training pitch. But when you know he leaves everything on the pitch, he you know when you walk into the change room, you, you're you're I don't know you're 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 your teammates. Mm. Like and that kind of you speak about obviously the different personalities and it had a very much like kind of a, a British kind of feel throughout the squad. And uh, people will have to try and remember this, and I'm pretty sure it is the case. Harry Kane was when on loan there, didn't he? And I have to ask, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a question I always have to ask people that have played with, obviously, like Harry Kane or like Gareth Bale or something. Could you, could you tell at that time? Because I remember watching him. I thought, this guy's shit. This, this guy, I, was, like, I remember watching it like, or like on his loan and I'm thinking, all right, this is just bang average player. What was it like? It, was he nowhere near it in terms of what uh, he Yeah, to be fair, when he walked in, he was quite shy and I think we sort of got the heads up that there was a, um, a Tottenham loanee coming in and we didn't know who it was. And obviously we heard that he played for the under 18s, done really well. And he had this kind of sort of scoring record that he'd done really well in the youth team. He's played a, a couple of times in the reserves and still scored plenty of goals, but just not been able to break in the first team. So obviously he'd come on loan at us. And I remember walking him in, the, he was walking in the, in the um, he walked into the change room and he had skinny jeans and, I don't know, he looked quite nervous and he was just, I don't know, he just he didn't sort of have any sort of confidence about him. So I think he's obviously a massive, he's a different player than what he is now. I'm guessing yeah. he's probably got a little bit more confidence than what he did. And I don't know, I don't think, 
when he was in training, I don't. It's difficult because obviously we didn't see much of him. He got but he got injured quite early and then was sent back um, to Tottenham. But in training, you can definitely tell that he had bits and parts of um, a very good like striker. Like the, yeah. he had a very good shot. Um, his left foot was good. Um, he'd hold the ball out well. Um, but sometimes I did think he was a little bit greedy at times. But strikers, I suppose, are greedy anyway. They want to score goals. But I remember, obviously, training to finish. And he'd always be like one of the ones that would be outside shooting. And even when there was nobody out there, he was one of the ones that was continuously like just smashing balls into the back of the net. Yeah. And he was using, obviously, I don't know, that sort of inside... Uh, foot that kind of like swerves and dips mm-hmm. and he was curling it using his left foot. He was always practicing different sort of shots. So you could see he obviously was hungry to sort of reach the top. But um, yeah, he's done phenomenally well. I, I, like I said, if, if I'm going to be honest, if, if I said there was going to be one person in the change room um, that would play for England, be England captain, you know, be a, a, a feared world striker, I probably wouldn't say Harry Kane. Yeah. But he's obviously defeated every, what everybody's for. And he's obviously got the right mentality and worked really hard over the last couple of years and you know he's he's done phenom- phenomenally well and yeah fair play to him no 100% mate like I think there's a, there's a famous picture isn't it when Watford played Leicester I think you've got Harry Kane on one side and then Vardy on the other side yeah. and you're thinking oh god um, yeah I know exactly what you mean obviously you like a promotion mate you do like a promotion is it three am I correct uh, so if you go Further back, there's actually five. I'm gonna count, I'm gonna give myself five. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there was one when I was in and around the first team at Luton, I was sort of on the bench every now and again. I'd sort of get kind of like three or four minutes off the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was promotion to uh League One. Um, and then my first, well, my first proper promotion, um, when I was playing a lot of games was West Brom. Yeah, that was my first season. Uh, we got promoted to the Premier League, which was obviously phenomenal. Then obviously moving to, to Norwich on, on loan to start off with. Uh, promotion to the Premier League, um, which was, yeah, another great promotion. Uh, when obviously Norwich didn't, um, didn't want my services and put me out on loan, there was another promotion um, at Cardiff mm-hmm. uh, into the Premier League. I think I only sort of played sort of eight or ten games. Yeah. Um, and I was sent back. I was gutted about that. I remember getting called back, um, I think it was the day before the, oh, what's it called, the parade, you know, where you get your trophies and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. obviously, I missed out on getting my, my trophy on the pitch. Oh, really? A little bit frustrating. Obviously, you've got to send in the post, but it's not the same. <laughs> um, and then my last, latest, last promotion was with Wigan. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was back into the championship after being relegated from League One. So, yeah, my maths is right. I think there's five. But I'll take that, probably, mate. Probably Probably three or four proper ones, I'd probably say. I will, I will talk about your, obviously, Norwich and the Prem. Because I have to ask, obviously, I'm, I'm a big Liverpool fan. Um, yeah. And I think whenever you hear Norwich Premier League, you probably hear Suarez quite after it. And, yeah. I, was, and I was when I was like, doing um, some research, I thought, there's a picture of, obviously, I think Suarez and, and you're one-on-one against him and so on. There's like three other Norwich players around him. Why Norwich? And just how good was he on the pitch? Because so many people have said, obviously, like, best player they've ever played against, without a doubt. And how good was he on the pitch? Um, you know, whenever he played Norwich, and I remember in that, well, I think in the, in the two years we were in the Premier League, I think we must, we must have played him about four times. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he'd score a hat-trick probably about three out of four the times. And he was, obviously, that, that one from halfway line, yeah. I can honestly say I wasn't on the pitch that line, so I can't, <laughs> can't blame me for that one. But, yeah, the one, the, when he, honestly, when you, when you see him, there's sort of, I used to, I probably underestimated him to be fair. I, I, yeah. I thought he was quite small. I knew he was quite strong and quite quick, but I thought I'd be able to handle it. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I remember sort of trying to give him a nudge and I remember just him just being so sort of low sense of gravity and just quite thick set, set and I wouldn't, wasn't able to sort of give him a nudge. Um, and I just think his movement was just, I don't know, just phenomenal. Something that I could never sort of see coming. I think he was sort of two or three steps ahead of me way before I could, obviously react and yeah he's probably the best player that I've played against and obviously I think Norwich especially in those couple of seasons really struggled to sort of read his sort of game and yeah he's like I said I think he's so obviously Atletico Madrid now but obviously he's been at Barcelona and, and Liverpool oh, yeah. and I think his even his international career sort of speaks for itself but 
yeah, Norwich found it very difficult to, to sort of handle him and, and, and keep him down. But like I said, the, the, the talent that he is and you know, the teams that he's played for, I think just speaks for itself. In that time with Norwich in the Premier League, I always think, uh, I'm talking about like the old school top four kind of thing was of, of the Premier League was still kind of there. Out of those, those kind of top four teams, who was the hardest team to play against? Um, yeah, I, you know, Liverpool. Liverpool were definitely hard. I think they were very attacking wise. They, they, I don't know. They just had a lot of players that would they would they were never the same. They would always have sort of a, a tall striker, maybe, maybe like Andy Carroll, mm-hmm. and then obviously the a small striker that was a little bit sharper on the floor and strong like Suarez. So um, I think Liverpool were definitely up there. Like I said, the top four were. They've obviously got world class players. And when when Man United was playing, that's when Rooney was you know at his best. Mm-hmm. Um, he was playing Rio Ferdinand at the back to, to stop any of the goals going in so um, they were good Man City obviously had Aguero uh, you know he's the history top goal scorer for, for Man City and yeah yeah, uh, you can wheel of all the names like they you know Chelsea had Drogba to obviously lean on I remember <laughs> Lukaku coming off the bench and I think to myself like you know <laughs> as big of it as a team that people probably think Norwich are you, you know you look at the talent that sort of Chelsea had and you know, they had, they, had, uh, they had Lampard playing, uh, Cavalio playing, mm. Ashley Cole was at his best check. Um, yeah, they, they, there's loads. Obviously, Arsenal, they, they had a lot of good players playing as well. So, I think, like I said, the Premier League for me is, I don't know if it's me being biased, but it's the best league in the world. You know, you've got oh, the, yeah. the world's best players, best managers, best stadiums. Mm. Um, I think at Norwich, it was, I don't know, it was a privilege to play against them. Um, I don't know whether they would say the same, but, you know, they struck. <laughs> Struggled to play against me, but definitely me playing against you know Suarez and and Drogba, and Lukaku, and you know Lampard. They were they were you know tough days that are I can envy, and it's something that no one can take away from me. Obviously, I can tell my kids that I played against them, and yeah. you know what a tough challenge it was. But yeah, it's a massive achievement for me, and you know I know for Norwich, it's not something that they probably think about, it, but um, yeah, just to be in the Premier League was was a bonus. I was going to say, and obviously, like you said, the promotion with Cardiff and. Again, you look at that team and core, like it's you, you look at that strong spine, Marshall in goal, uh, Hudson obviously at the back, obviously, uh, Peter Whitting obviously sadly passed away, Craig Bellamy, players like yourself, proper football players. Was that very similar to when you went there, very similar to kind of the Norwich spirit in, in terms of gaining results, not with maybe the best technical players, but the drive, the team kind of atmosphere, everything? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think it was a similar sort of team to Norwich. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, they didn't have sort of many sort of players that had come down from the Premier League and was sort yeah. of they knew the game. Obviously, Craig Bellamy was there, and I think he was a massive pull for the players as well. Um, but I do think they had like a they had a good team spirit, similar to what Norwich had. They, they I don't know, they just found a way of winning. They weren't the most technical or best players in the league. They just knew how to get results and they knew how to grind down teams and it all stuck together and worked hard. And I think, obviously, if you want to get promoted, that's sort of the ingredients that you probably need to, to get over the line. But, yeah, obviously, Malcolm Mackay was there. But I do feel, and I say it time and time again, when I, come, when I went there, I think the, the league was done and dusted. They didn't really need me there. I think I was sort of there just to fill the gap. I remember Mark Hudson, the captain, was obviously injured for the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they sort of ran out of centre-halves. They didn't have no many sort of fit centre-halves. I remember going in with my first game and Ben Nugent was was a young sort of, I think he was like 18, 19-year-old. We played together for the first time. Kept a clean sheet against Sheffield Wednesday. And I don't know, like I said, I don't think they really needed me. I, yeah. It was like I was sort of, they just put me there just to give me the trophy. I, it was already done and dusted. They were already top of the league. They already had a, a big margin. And I don't know, that when I saw the players that they had they, and the team spirit that they had, like I said, I don't think they needed me. Like they, they were playing good football as it is. And mm. so I was delighted to go there to pick up another medal. But yeah, yeah they, I, when I think when I was already there, the league had already done and dusted. And we'll talk on, obviously, I've, I've listened to so many podcasts, so many interviews with, on Sky, on wherever. Just how good in terms of player and technical ability was... Peter Whitting obviously he sadly passed away. Like, how good was he? Like, I remember watching him live, obviously, 
going towards Reading quite a bit. Obviously, I'm quite close to the stadium. The things, I remember one goal, I think he just shifted out of his foot away at the Majeski and just winds one in and it's it like one minute gone and just, just plods along like nothing ever. Yeah, it's, it's tough because I think um, a lot of people obviously say kind of words once he's, uh, once people have passed away. But yeah, I would still say obviously kind of words if he was still alive. And I think that anybody that, that's obviously played with him at, at Cardiff, uh, Aston Villa, Blackburn, wherever he's been, will say the same, that he's absolutely got a wonder of a left foot. He's just, yeah. I don't know, you can give it to him any, anywhere on the pitch um, and you can trust him with the ball. You wouldn't, you know, there could be a tight area in the pitch and you can give it to him and you trust that he wouldn't give the ball away. And mm. I don't know, he always had that sort of magic or that sort of, um, that sort of moment in a, in a game that could win you a game, uh, a football match. And yeah, it's, it's obviously a sad loss, but he was, he was very special. He was, I don't know, I, even off the pitch, I thought he was a bit of a gentleman as well. Like, there wasn't sort yeah. of many things that people would say that are quite negative about him. And I think, I don't know, he helped me settle in. And, you know, I was a little bit you know, frustrated that he's obviously passed away. And it's obviously someone that, you know, stay in the hearts of, of many, especially like the, the Cardiff fans. And he was very successful there. But, yeah, it was very difficult that, that he's obviously passed away. But, yeah, he, he, was a, he was a very, very good player. Oh, no doubt, mate. You then obviously, well, like you say, you... You got the promotion. Obviously, you weren't there for, for the parade and stuff like that. And Did you then go on to play for Wigan after that? Yeah, so, so I remember going back to Norwich um, and not really playing. I remember Chris Hume was there. And, you know, um, like I said, you know, when a new manager comes in, you've got to impress. And for some reason, I didn't, I didn't fit his game plan. So yeah. I saw my contract run out. I wasn't really panicking. I was just kind of thinking, you know, where am I going to sign? So I actually like, well, I actually loved being at Norwich. I love, obviously being around the boys and um, obviously I had children at the time and I thought yeah. that's where I'm going to settle. That's where I wanted to settle and that's where, you know, I, I enjoyed sort of playing football and um, out of the blue, um, we're going to come up and I know they, the previous year that they sort of played Arsenal. I remember watching them play Arsenal and they lost 4-1 and got relegated. Yeah. Later on in the season, they won the FA Cup and um, obviously when I had the phone call that, you know, Wigan that were interested, I was, I, yeah, I said, I listen, I've got to go there. If I've got nothing else at the table, yeah. that's probably the next best thing that I could obviously ask for. You know, a team that's obviously won the FA Cup, they're going to be playing in Europa League. Yeah. Favourites to go up in the Championship. Um, and it, yeah, it just ticked all the boxes for me. Obviously, it was another long travel from Norwich to, to, to Manchester or Wigan. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't reject that one. That was one that, you know, has to, has to get over the line. And was that, obviously, you spoke about Europe. Did you, how far did Wigan go in in the Europa League? Like, oh. yeah, so yeah, so it was so honestly so close. We got to the um, so we were in group stages. Yeah, um, I think we missed out by one point on the last game. Um, I think the manager might have just tinkered around with the team purely because we had quite a lot of games in that league. Obviously, in the Championship, you have a lot of games. I think you have sort of you know, forty six games, and then um, you've obviously got the FA Cup, you've got the League yeah. Cup. Um, and obviously we were still in the Europa League so we had a game I think it was sort of Thursday Sunday Tuesday and it was quite a big turnaround and I think obviously the manager sort of rested players which is fair enough Who was the manager uh, at the time? Um, but I, I think it was Owen Cooler who was the manager at the time and um, like I said I think he just I don't know whether he sort of his priority was sort of the league um, yeah. which is fair enough for the boys that I've never seen not played in, in Europe like myself I wanted to go as far as I could in that league. That was obviously a massive achievement to play in the Europa League. And, um, yeah, we missed out. And I think we found that if we did, if we did, um, if we did obviously come in the top two, we would have got Sevilla away. So that would have been, that would have been phenomenal. But like I said, I think the manager obviously tinkered around with the team and yeah. was sort of looking to, to cement a place in sort of the Premier League and maybe mode, which obviously didn't happen. Yeah, talking of promotion, obviously, could have been another one to add to the add to the list, mate. Um, obviously, didn't go to plan. Obviously, got knocked out by QPR. How kind of for you was it? Kind of like in terms of a personal kind of gain, you were like, did you just want to get back up to the Premier League, or did you just want to be playing quality football wherever you could? Yeah, that that's, that season was a it's a bit of a weird one. We had. It was sounds silly, but we was like it felt like we had the players similar to like Man City. We had all the best players in the league. Yeah, we just didn't know how to play together. So I, mm. I, 
I don't think that works. I remember this, like, looking at the team that we had, and it was phenomenal. Like, if you take even taking away my name, obviously I'm not one of the bigger players there, but a lot of the players that we had that played in the Premier League or had been, you know, taken from other Premier League play teams and you know been in team of the week or team of the year, yeah. and I don't know, we probably were favourites to go up, but I don't know, we just didn't work out. You know, I remember we were getting to the semi final of the of the FA Cup, and obviously being in the um, being in the Europa League. I don't know whether it just got too much for us and, you know, the amount of games that we played, I mean, I think I personally played 50 games that season, which is unheard of. You don't really see many players that play that much. But, yeah, we got to the semi-final of the FA Cup and uh, got to the semi-final of the playoffs. And I think that playoff one, for me personally, was was quite tough. And I think that's where I found sort of one of my lows in football. I felt that it was my fault that we, you know, we didn't yeah. get to the final. I felt that I could have done better. I don't know whether anybody else could have felt like that, but, I don't know, I really took it to heart that game. And, um, yeah, that, that game wasn't sort of my finest moment. I don't think it was one of the moments that are, I don't know, that I feel that I've done well at. I don't know, I just think that game was one of the worst games. I think a lot of people say they'd rather lose in the semi-final than to get to the final and, and, yeah. and then lose, which is fair enough, but I've never got to the final of, 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 a, of a playoff. Yeah. Um, so the only sort of playoff that I've had is that, that semi-final winning. It did hurt. It hurt quite a lot. Like I said, I've never been in the playoffs and, yeah, it was difficult to take. You say that the type of players you had there, like, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like Al Habsi, uh, Sean Maloney, Gary Caldwell. Is it that that guy from Chelsea, DeSanto, was he still there? Uh, no. So, he, he, yeah, he, I think he left uh, to go uh, Wolfsburg in yeah. Germany. So, yeah, there was Scott Carson, he was there. Ben Watson, that scored in the FA Cup. Um, James McLean was there, uh, Marco Fortune, James Perch, Emerson Boy. So there was, honestly, there was bundles of uh, Premier League experience. But oh, yeah. like I said, it might, it, there probably wasn't that much championship experience. There wasn't yeah. sort of any knowledge of, of that sort of league because that league is tough. You know, playing, especially if you're playing season, like Thursday, Sunday, Tuesday. Thir- and in that kind of up and down the country, everywhere, well, European yeah. tours and all that lot. <laughs> Well, I remember we, um, we, I think we travelled to uh, Ruben Kazan in Russia uh, cool. on, the, on the Wednesday, uh, played them on the, on the Thursday, and I think we sh- flew straight to Yeovil um, because we had Yeovil on, on the Sunday, and that was, that was one of the toughest games we've ever played. And we scraped a 1 0 win, and I don't know, was, the, the wind was howling against us, uh, <laughs> the rain was hammering down, the boys were absolutely shattered. Um, and I think a lot of people looked at that game and thought, oh, yeah, we're going to nail it on to win the game. And, <laughs> and you were like, no. No it, <laughs> no, it was just one of those games where it was just so tough. And I think Yeovil were actually the better team that absolutely battered us. And we, yeah. I don't know, somehow stole a, stole a goal and won that game. But, yeah, if anybody saw that game, they, they, yeah, they wouldn't think it was Wigan. But, yeah, it was very tough. You spent three, three four years at Wigan? Yeah, three years. Three years at Wigan. And- um, yeah, that's gone, but carry on. No, I I loved every single one of those years. I've told people before, like there was always something going on. Like I said, the, the first year um, we got to the semi final of the, the the playoffs. Semi finals, the FA Cup. But unfortunately, somehow got relegated. Um, second year, no, sorry, sorry. In the second year, we got relegated, mm-hmm. um, and then obviously the third year. Um, got promotion, so there's always something happening, something exciting. Um, yeah, and I, I did actually like my time there. A lot of the time, where I've not wanted to go to a club, I've actually enjoyed it more. I was gonna say, and then, you, did you then go to Bury or Northampton first? Yeah, so I went to Bury. I remember my contract running out at, at Wigan, and um, I was in the summer, and I remember obviously kids going back to school and. It must have been about a week before the season started. And I was literally at home thinking, you know, what is going on? Like, I've had this sort of thing in my head. Like, a, a lot of players probably think the same. Maybe we think, you know, I've been promoted. I should be able to jump yeah. a better team straight away. And I remember there was an offer that come in and I rejected it because my ego was quite big then. Not yeah. big, but it was just, I don't know, I don't want to go there. I want to start. I've been promoted. Club. Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah. I thought I, I, thought I might have got a little bit better. Um, and that offer went. Then there was no offers really on the table. Barry came in, um, and I had like I had to sign there. I had to sign there because I, I had nothing else, and I wanted to play else. football. I didn't want to 
no, I didn't want to go into the season then looking for a club because at the start of the season, people have already got their sort of players anyway. So mm -hmm. um, I signed at Berry. Um, I'd done a year there, very tough year. Obviously, I was what, house down in, in Bedford near Milton Keynes and I was travelling backwards and forwards. I found it really difficult. Um, yeah. Kids were at school, I wanted to stay at them. I wouldn't get home till sort of, well, I'd get up about six o'clock, get the train, drive to, get a train to, sorry, um, to, where would it be? To Stockport, drive to training. Um, yeah, that was full on. Wouldn't, and I wouldn't get home till sort of like four, maybe five o'clock. And I wouldn't get any time to see the kids. And I, yeah. I, know, I know a lot of people say, you know, it's harder doing a nine to five job, which it is. But I don't know, I just found it difficult in terms of the whole sort of build up, train, train, um, intense training session, get on a train, and then just, yeah, just like basically just collapsing on when I get home. <laughs> Obviously, we've, we've seen what happened to the club now and stuff. And at that time, was it anything like that when you were there or, or was it quite normal? Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a di different one, weird one, uh, really. I remember some of the boys um, not being paid. So yeah. I remember some of the boys getting paid like a week later. Um, and then the next month, they might get paid by different companies. Okay. Um, and then some boys getting paid sort of half their wages and then get paid in installments. And I think a lot of the boys, not even just myself, a lot of the boys thought, you know, something's going on here. I remember one of the boys getting paid by a nail company. So, yeah, that was a bit oh, of a no. weird one. But, um, yeah, just, I, I don't know. I, I think they, because they moved into sort of Man City's old training ground, I think yeah. that sort of took up a lot of their money. I think training ground was lovely, but I don't think, Barry had the money to sort of maintain it. He was always sort of dirty and cobwebs everywhere. And I don't know, I, they probably didn't really need that training ground, really. They could have probably spent a bit more money just, I don't know, playing the on players. the stage. Yeah, or even playing the players, playing the staff. I think there was a lot of people that were losing their job. And yeah, it was a bit, bit of a difficult time at Barry. You then, I've just got down here and, and you might not actually know this. In that season, you were there at Barry, uh, Barry sorry, 12 game losing streak and 16 games in the middle of the season without a win and yeah do you think that coincide with like some players getting paid like all this stuff do you think they kind of come together as a two like you get stuff like that because the atmosphere that that's being created not by say the management or the players but the club is having a major effect on you players uh, yeah, it's difficult because when we was at Wigan, we had a we had a um, we had a similar sort of, I suppose you can say, a little crisis like that as well. We you know we just couldn't find a win, we couldn't find anything to get us over the line. But I remember at Wigan, I think it's not, it probably is an excuse, but I do think that sort of not having that security of you know when you're going to get paid does sort of creep into your head as well because you don't oh, yeah. know a lot of the, a lot of the players there are like any other normal person. They've got families, they've got mortgages. Yeah. They've got other stuff to pay for, and that is their livelihood. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it is difficult when you're sort of trying your best on the training ground and mm -hmm. you turn up to the game and you're trying to get those three points, but, you know, ultimately you're not sort of getting anything back from the club. You're sort yeah, of, of course. It's everyday life. People, people moan at sort of football players for, for getting paid a lot of money, and I understand that now it is getting ridiculous sort of the, 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 how much people are getting paid, but those sort of wages aren't the same all the way through the league. Oh, no. no. Players in League One and Two and, and, and the National League, they, they do have mortgages and families that they have to feed. So it's, I don't know, it's just like any other normal job. You know, you go into a job and you work and you kind of get paid as well. So that's, that's oh, the sort yeah. of thing of it. So, yeah, I, I do think that did play a big part in the season. I think everybody sort of had the same idea. Like, you know, they didn't really know what was going on, really. Didn't know whether the club yeah. was going to you know, shut down, didn't know when they were going to get paid. And, yeah, I think it was not just the players. I think it was the staff that were in the same sort of boat. And we spoke, obviously, quickly there about your time at Northampton. And I want to talk about this this bit here. Obviously, you're not playing now. Yeah. Obviously, you can explain why that is. And what was what's that experience like? Because I can't imagine, like, I see you now. You're probably a like, fit, healthy guy. Probably can, probably can still go play. Yeah. Obviously, what happened, if you want to explain that a bit more? Um, it was a bit of a weird one, really. I remember when I was obviously 30, I kind of had the, the idea and the plan to sort of... I remember speaking to my financial advisor and my plan was obviously to retire at 30, 35, mm -hmm. um, 
and obviously do loads of little, I don't know, things that were investments and stuff like that just yeah. to, to keep me ticking over. Um, and obviously when I was at Northampton, I was 32. Um, and obviously over a period of the season, I found out that, you know, I had scarring on my heart, which is a bit of a, a bit of a shock to the system, really, bearing in mind you have loads of medicals throughout the, yeah. well, f- when you sign at Northampton, you have a medical. When you sign at other clubs, you have medical. So it was something that they didn't pick up, which is, I don't know, a bit for- unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just obviously restricted me from playing. Like now I have a, a, a pacemaker and a, and a defibrillator. So um, any time that I sort of get a, well, the defibrillator gives my heart a sort of free chances to get back into rhythm. So if I was doing any high intensity training and mm-hmm. uh, my, my heart rhythm wasn't the same all the way through, um, it would give my heart, my heart free chances to get back into a normal rhythm. If not, it would deliver an instant shock. Um, and I had a choice either to retire and get the defibrillator yeah. um, and obviously help me obviously live longer or run the risk of continuing playing football. And similar to Fabrice Moramba, he obviously collapsed and died on the pitch for, for 90 minutes and yeah. obviously been revived. But that could have been me. I could have obviously died on the pitch and never come back. So I had to make that sort of, you know, um, option whether I want to carry on and play obviously for myself yeah. or do I maybe think about the bigger picture and retire and get this fitted and, um, you know, look after my family. And that, that, was, that was the option I went for. And obviously, like I said, I, I never wanted to retire. Never thought I'd retire at, at 32. Um, 35 now, so I probably would have been thinking about sort of yeah. um, down things and, and thinking what I was going to do. But yeah, it come to come as a massive shock. But I think it was a bit of an eye-opener as well. And I think because, I don't want to say it's because of me, but when I retired, I think people probably looked at what they were doing as well. So I know um, Fraser Franks uh, retired probably a couple of months after me. There's a similar sort of thing. Um, I don't know how he's doing it, but I think Danny Blind. Yep. Um, he's got the exact same thing. He's been fitted with um, a defibrillator like like I have, mm-hmm. and he's actually playing on. Um, oh, and I read sort of a couple of months ago that he had sort of um, fainted on the pitch, and yeah, I, I, I don't understand how he's still going on, but mm. fair play to him. Um, but yeah, it's just an, an eye opener for, for anyone that's obviously worried about any sort of heart conditions or. Definitely. Anything like that, it might be worth just getting checked out because obviously it is life threatening. No, mate, no doubt at all. And I can't imagine like 32, Jesus Christ, you're still young. Do you know what I mean? Like you're probably feeling fit and healthy. And then to be told that, it's like I said, a bit, bit of a shock to the system. What I like to do, mate, is I like to do a quick um, question and answer um, some questions. So I'm going to put you on the spot a couple of times. Um, Okay. And yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Best goal you've ever scored? Oh, it'd have to be uh, Wigan versus Chesterfield. Um, I think at the time, you know what, the first goal, um, but the score ended 3-2. I won't mm-hmm. say to who, to, to, the, um, to afterwards, but um, I remember the first couple of, I think it might be 12 minutes I scored an own goal. Um, so obviously Chesterfield were 1-0 up. Then I think, uh, we went into half night, half time 2 0 down, um, and then come out in the second half. I think Jordi Haula scored, yep. make it 2 1 to us. Um, and then uh, there was a corner from the left hand side. Um, I've gone up, um, and I thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna hang back. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start on the edge of the box, I'm gonna run in and score or try and get my head on it. I thought, you know what, last minute, I'm gonna hang back. So, anyway, corner's gone in, and one of their players have sort of headed it to the back of the to the edge of the box, I've sort of chested it down and swung my right foot and it's just gone into the bottom left-hand corner and that's probably my, uh, my favourite goal. It ended up being 3-2 in the end, so we, we won that game. So, yeah, I think for the moment, that was sort of my best favourite goal. I bet you hit it and you're like, oh, that doesn't normally go in. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I, I actually don't think I actually watched it go in. I actually thought, you know, I caught it well, but I don't know whether it's gone over the bar. I actually yeah. didn't know where I hit it. But, yeah. Best player you've ever played with? Uh, it's tough to be fair I don't think I can name one there's obviously a lot of players that people have their opinion on that probably think mm-hmm. that I played great football with obviously Harry Kane was at, at Norwich and mm-hmm. um, Harry Maguire was, was at Wigan um, but yeah I, I don't think I could name one off the top of my head you might have to give me a couple of more minutes for that 
Oh, I'll come back to that at the end. Give me a couple. Best play you've ever played against? Uh, yeah. I think there's, there's, like I said, there's quite a few. Suarez is obviously one of them. Obviously, he caused me a bit of a heartache at, at Norwich and along with the rest of the squad. Drogba was obviously a massive, massive player as well. I think he showed what he can do. Steven Gerrard obviously could pick a pass, could do anything on the pitch. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of players like Van Persie. I remember him being at Arsenal. The last year he was at Arsenal. He, I think he scored sort of 30 goals and then made a, a free move to Man City, uh, Man United the, the season after. Um, Aguero, Silva. I think a lot of them are sort of in that elite uh, yeah. level. Um, so it's, it is difficult to pick one. But yeah, they're all sort of talented in their own sort of different way. Favourite manager you've worked under? Um, one of? You know what? I think Paul Lambert was one of uh, my favourite managers. Obviously, he was very intense on the pitch. And like I said, I, I compare him, not compare him, but he reminded me a bit of like Diego Simeone. He would always work hard. And, you know, I think we went into, into teams not knowing what was going on. And his team talks that he would deliver were intense. Like we thought, you know what, I'm coming out of this meeting and I feel like, a, like I'm a man possessed. I feel like I can beat anybody on the pitch. I can do whatever I want and the shackles are off. And I don't know, it just made us feel like we were sort of that extra bit better than anybody in the league. Favourite moment in football? Um, I don't have one, sorry. But right. um, it probably, probably be all the promotions, just being able to sort of, I don't know, you don't see many sort of good times on the pitch. Obviously, when you score a goal, it's a great time. But mm. And then when you're lifting the, sh- um, the trophy and you're celebrating with your teammates and you're spraying champagne, you know, that's probably the, the favourite most, you know, moments on the pitch. Obviously, you work hard the whole whole season and, um, yeah, you, you get sort of treated by lifting a trophy that you've worked hard through. Um, obviously, training sessions, matches. And yeah, if you've worked hard for the whole system, you get preserved with a, a trophy, that is, which is great. No, mate, no doubt. And last one, what are you up to now? Obviously, after playing, what, what's next and what are you up to at the moment? Uh, so I run my own sort of football academy um, in the Bedfordshire area. Um, we first did sort of holiday camps. It was for ages, boys and girls, all abilities from ages sort of five to, to 12. Um, we still do that. Hopefully, we're going to do one in uh, April. Um, and our next step is to run a football education academy where um, year 11s or 16 to, 7, 16 to, to 18 year olds, they obviously do their education, which is a very important part of, of any sort of life. Um, so they can continue their education. Um, and then they obviously do training with me as well, which is, um, which is another good thing that obviously kids can do. Amazing, mate. Um, but yeah. That's, uh, that's me done there, mate. Um, I think it's been great to have you on and, and talk about what you've done. Um, oh, John Boy, I guess, as well. Um, yeah. And yes, mate, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Make sure everyone likes and subscribe. And yeah, pal, it's been a privilege. Cheers, mate. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers, pal.